and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. This week on our panel, we have Josh Justice. Hey, everyone. I'm Charles Max Wood from DevChat.tv. Um, I just, I'm so excited. I have to say it. Um, my book's going live. <laughs> awesome. Yay. So if you're uh, on the job market, you want to have a little bit more stability. If you wind up on the job market, go check out the book. It's the Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's on Amazon. We'll put a, lo- a link in the show notes. Infinite Red is a U.S.-based consultancy specializing in React and React Native. They do mobile app and web design and development. They are deeply involved in the React and React Native open source communities, publish the React Native newsletter with 10,000 subscribers, and are involved with the React Native core development. If you have a project and need design or engineering help from an experienced team to take it all the way from concept to completion, get in touch with Infinite Red. You can find them at infinite.red. Make sure to mention you heard about them in this ad. So, Josh, you you brought up this topic, and it was kind of funny while, while we were discussing it. Yeah, I, I was a QA engineer in the past, uh, before I was a developer. Um, and uh, it, it this is something that came up in another conversation that I had with somebody else, too. Um, and it's it was, yeah, where's that line between... QA and development, right? Um, what what are what are our roles? I guess is is you know where it comes in. Do you do you want to clarify that a little bit or add yeah. some nuance to it? Yeah. So I spent about ten years of my career um, not doing any automated testing at all. Um, just point and click and click through and run through it. And I remember an e-commerce website I worked on where I must have gone through the checkout process five hundred times by hand as we were coding it. Um, so I worked there where there was a QA team and there was no developer testing at all. Um, and then in the last couple of years, I've worked in an environment where we don't have a QA team, like we just have developer automated testing. And I've like been revolutionized by that. It's totally turned my career around in, in an amazing way. Um, but just now on my latest client project, um, we have developer automated testing and we also have a QA department. And they are actually, they've been doing manual testing up to this point, but they're looking into putting in uh, a QA automation as some of the other apps within this client organization have had. And so we're all coming across this question of like, what is the role of developer tests versus QA tests? The other thing I should say is, and we can get into this in just a little bit, but as I think is pretty common um, in mobile development, there's not a lot of developer UI tests or developer right. end-to-end tests. So this is the idea, the question of even like, what are our different roles is not something that the organization has gotten into. So I'm looking forward to just us as a team figuring that out, but I wanted to discuss and get your thoughts and the listeners' thoughts on the, um, on the relationship as well. Yep, interesting. So let, let me give a little bit of context here as far as my work in QA. So I started out, I was uh, finishing up college and I got a full-time job working at a company called Mosey. And they had, it was basically uh, online backup. They were one of the first ones out there. The, they and Carbonite and a couple of others are now all owned by Dell. And so, yeah. In fact, if you go look up Mosey now, Carbonite was our primary competitor. And now it's Mosey by Carbonite, which is, anyway, it, it still makes me kind of smile a little bit. Because I'm like, man, back in the day. <laughs> but yeah. anyway... So I ran the tech support department there for about a year and a half. And by tech support, I mean customer support, right? So we'd answer emails, answer phone calls. And then while I was doing that, I decided, because we, we'd wind up with the same kind of issues, and then they'd release a new version, and we'd still have the same issues. And so I put together a little like grid, right? And it was just a Google Sheet. And it was, these are all the things that I'm going to test before the next release, right? Because we'd get the releases early. And then I would report the bugs back to the developers. And, you know, that they, they would sometimes get fixed. And so, um, you know, and they were trying, but there were only like 10 of us in the company. So um, at the time, that's where things were. Um, eventually, after a few months, that grew into them hiring a QA consultant to come in and, you know, get things going in earnest. And she came in and she, you know, she kind of got things rolling and then helped hire another QA uh, person. And I was still running the, the support department, but I had all the data on, these are our most common problems, right? <laughs> and so I would hand that off to QA or development at that point. And eventually 
I'm not going to go into all the politics that happened, but I wound up moving out of support. And I went to my boss because at the same time, you know, I was on the management track. We had just been acquired by EMC Corporation, which later got acquired by Dell. Um, I was on the management track. And the more I got into building the tools we were using, that's how I got into Ruby on Rails. Um, got into the tools we were building to run support, the more I realized I wanted to be a developer. So I went to my boss and I said, look, I was like, obviously, you don't want me in support. So, you know, got handed off to somebody else. And then, you know, how do I get to be a developer? Well, the developers were king in the organization. So he couldn't just put me on the development team. So he put me in QA. And so we ran QA for, uh, I was there for about a year doing QA. And then I eventually left. And I'm not going to go into all those reasons either. But while I was there, what we did is we did a lot of manual testing. It was almost all manual testing. There were tools out there that would allow you to drive the UIs on the desktop or on the, um, on the web because there was a web component as well because that's where you'd go to get your... You could get them through the, the client on your desktop machine, but you could also get them on the web and download a giant zip file or something. So, you know, we would test all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, we had big corporate clients like GE running backups through us and stuff. And, you know, I was still kind of the primary point person for support there because I had built relationships with them over the, the course of the years because I was the senior support guy. And so I wound up on those accounts. So anyway, that's kind of where things went. And yeah, so you kind of got this manual process and I was pushing them to allow us to script the QA and never quite succeeded at that before I left. So... Yeah, and, and half of our team was in India and the other half was in Utah. So that was also another thing that, you know, maybe we can talk about if you have remote QA teams. But yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of where we were at. So I've, I've kind of seen this from both ends. And yeah, so there, there's definitely some nuance there. But yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit more about what you're seeing and then we can kind of, you know, just discuss where this all goes. Sure. Maybe uh, defining some terms could be useful because I've heard a number of different terms in this area thrown around right. and uh, we have different, maybe different experiences for, for what it involves. Um, so again, I also have a Rails background. Um, so I know uh, in, so I imagine you've worked with like Capybara for feature tests or before. Yeah, yeah Capybara so, and uh, Selenium, Selenium WebDriver, a few right. others. Yeah. yeah. So I know um, in, in our spec in the Rails Ruby world, uh, feature test was a common term that was used. Um, and all of these refer to basically, you know, the, the common ground is walking through a steps a user would take, like go to this screen or web page, click on this, type in that, verify that this is on the screen, mm -hmm. maybe some getting under the hood and checking stuff in the database as well. Yeah. But the core that I'm discussing is that the UI part. So UI automation tests is another related term. Fe system test kind of emphasizes the fact that it's the whole system altogether being tested. Right. Feature test kind of emphasizes that each one is like, like maybe it's the shopping cart feature and maybe it's the checkout feature. Mm -hmm. Acceptance test is another her term that I've heard um, from one of the books that was really influential for me, uh, referring to that in a sense, a customer could spell it out or you could maybe spell it out for the customer and the customer could see, oh yeah, this is how I want checkout to work. Oh, it does, it passes. Cool, I can accept this feature as working. And then one more term about it that I heard was end-to-end, -end, kind of referring to it's like it's, every, it's from the user interface, it's actually hitting the database, maybe it's not 100% end-to-end because maybe you are stubbing out like you're not actually charging a credit card or whatever. But yeah, do you, have you, are you familiar with all those terms? Do you feel like they're more or less overlapping or do you see distinctions between those? Do you feel like, do you equate those in your head? Do you see significant differences or differences of emphases between those? Generally, I think there are accepted definitions for most of these. Um, I do see some nuance in like feature and integration tests. I mean, end-to-end -end tests are pretty well understood. Um, some system tests can be, you know, again, a lot of this, and what's funny is a lot of it's defined by the organization, right? Not necessarily even the industry. Yeah. So we've seen different organizations define some of these different ways, like a feature test or an integration test. But as long as everybody's using the same vernacular, you know, you, you can get away with a lot. Um, so you have to make sure that you have them defined. But yeah, end to end is, and maybe UI automation tests are the only ones that I'm really seeing that have like a, a well understood, commonly accepted, yeah, uh, yeah. Term, terminology. Yeah. 
We actually had a misunderstanding between me and QA on the term end-to-end testing. Um, so I was using that term because I was so detox, but one of the testing tools that automates the UI on React Native refers to itself as an end-to-end testing tool. I'm pretty sure Cypress on the web also does. Yes. And yet um, I was in both cases, so like uh, Cypress has built in like request response mocking so that you're just testing your, like if you have like a single page app, JavaScript application, for mm-hmm. example, you're just testing that and not testing the backend API at the same time, or you can go all the way through. Right. Um, Detox doesn't have any stubbing features like that built in. Um, I ended up putting in uh, some features into our app manually to allow stubbing out requests and responses. Right. But I was still referring to it, it to it as an end-to-end test. Whereas in QA, they were very specifically tasked with, hey, like we, we need to hit the real staging you know, API. Yep. We need to verify that an order was correctly placed in another system. So the, to us, that's end-to-end. And I was like, yeah. oh, like me using that term has caused a misunderstanding here. Sorry about that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because yeah, my understanding of end-to-end test is yeah, no stubbing. So you're you're testing the full suite of uh, tools, backend services, the whole nine yards. You're, you're how about if a thing. how about if a credit card was being charged? Would you um, stub that out or just hit like a sandbox credit card server? Maybe you hit a sandbox. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So it is it's testing all the real types of systems and then yep. no stubbing, like you said. Yep. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So. so so now that we kind of laid out this category, which is a good amount of overlap for this kind of testing, I'd say um, I, as an observation, I've seen it a lot on the web. I mean, you know, Cypress oh, is yeah. a t- tool that's really helped establish. I mean, you know, Selenium has been around for a long time and there's pros and cons to that. Cypress was yep. created to address a number of the cons and I'm a really, really, really big fan of Cypress. Ember.js has had it built into their stack. Uh, Vue.js in their CLI tool has an option to enable, mm-hmm. hey, do you want end-to-end testing or not? You can choose Cypress or another option. So I see it very standard on the web, but UI automation testing, I I see it much less commonly on mobile. And at Big Nerd Ranch, having an Android and iOS team, those folks can speak to the fact that they don't see it very much. Have you done as much or seen as much on the native development side to see if there's a a difference in the amount of uh, end-to-end testing you've seen over there? Um, I've looked around. I haven't seen a ton of it. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I think, I mean... Let's see. Microsoft has a product uh, for it. I'm trying to remember. There's Sauce Labs does a mm-hmm. bunch of it. Yep. So yeah, you you see it, but generally it's okay. Here's this tool. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna pay for it and set it up, and then it's gonna run through the the app, right? So it installs the app and runs. Right. Yeah, I think there's probably a few different ways to do it, but yeah, yeah, it installed the app and runs. There's different levels of the whole uh, black box testing versus gray box testing. Right. So I was just catching up on that in the documentation because I have a workshop coming up where I want to be able to explain that well. But so detox for React Native, like Cypress, uh, just, well, I'm not sure if Cypress describes itself as gray box testing. I'm pretty sure I've heard that at some point. I don't know. Detox does. But the, the terms, of, if the listeners are not familiar, the idea of black box in general is like, you don't know any of the internals. Like, oh, just, I, yeah. I'm agnostic to that. I just give inputs and I check out. Yep. Whereas gray box kind of like adjusts the metaphor to say, well, like it's not, it's not totally isolated. And so in the case of detox, um, it actually uh, uh, builds the app slightly differently. Um, I think it puts um, like a WebSocket connection into the app so that when you're running your test runner from the command line, it's actually communicating over a WebSocket to your application. And that's how it's able to mm-hmm. sim- not simulate, but actually execute uh, taps and typing in and things like that. And in those cases, you get like you get a little bit less realism because it's mm-hmm. gray box testing that's running not quite the same way. Right. But what we've I think I've seen or I think we've seen as an industry is apps are so feature rich and like asynchronous now that um, some of the older techniques like Selenium that are totally agnostic, uh, you can just end up with a lot of test flake as a result of like, oh, I, I didn't know there's an animation still running. I didn't know you had yeah. an Ajax request that was still running. And so I found for developer testing that the trade-offs of gray box testing that Detox and Cypress have, they're, they're worth it to get the kind of reliability we want for developer tests. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is something then to be said for the black box testing where um, effectively somebody, you know, if, if there is a long running um, Ajax request or a long running animation or something like that, you know, you, you're not going to catch those if your gray box test is essentially waiting for them to complete however long it takes right yeah and so you know there's there's a certain ux or customer experience component to that that you may miss 
That's a good point. I haven't thought about the benefits of, of those timeouts happening. It's like, oh, I, I want that to be visible to me. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, really, there, there are trade-offs. Yeah. I really see that as a as a both and thing. Like, and it's it's tough because I don't, you know, folks are just getting into testing. I don't want to tell them they have to write 17 different types of tests. They certainly don't right. have to. Um, but when I hear objections like, oh, well, I want maximum realism in my end-to-end tests, or, I mean, another thing is Cypress currently only runs on Chrome, and folks want to know their web, well, less these days, but <laughs> hopefully I encourage folks to want their website to work on Firefox and other browsers. Yes. But I think you could do both and. Just like uh, Cypress recommends, hey, step, we recommend most, mostly stubbing the back end, but you can have maybe have a few tests that really hit the real back end just to make yep. sure. It's like a spoke test. In the same way, it's like maybe your Cypress test and your detox test on React Native fully cover all the features of your application, but then maybe you have some, te- Appium is a tool on React Native and other native applications that is black box and runs outside of it and runs on hardware devices, um, runs yeah. across many different devices. So maybe you have some Appium tests, but maybe they don't need to cover every single um, feature, or maybe they won't fail your build. Maybe you don't run them on CI, you just run those as a part of a, a QA test suite to get visibility into how it's running on all these different devices. But maybe it's those detox tests that run on CI and they'll fail the build if they're not working because maybe that gray box testing gives you that higher reliability. Yeah. Well, the other thing to keep in mind with a lot of these too is that a lot of times the UI automation tests can get a little bit complicated. And the thing that I tell people to look at too is just, you know, what's the ROI, you know? And in this case, what what the ROI is, is mitigating risk. So how much, how much risk are you mitigating here, right? So if it's on the credit card page and the animation takes too long and the, the user drops out, you know, you're mitigating a lot of risk, right? Because you want them to pay you. But if you're, if you're trying to make, uh, you know, your end-to-end or your, your end-to-end, I'm going to use end-to-end and UI automation interchangeably because that's just kind of how I think about some of it. Yeah. But if you're using your UI automation, to do your entire app and you want it to all be realistic and blah, 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 blah. It may not be the worth the effort for a lot of areas of your app. And so you have to take that into account too. And just say, look, if I tap here, eventually I get what I expected. And then, you know, count on your QA team to actually go and work through the UI periodically and, you know, be aware, okay, this is taking a little too long. This is not working as expected. This didn't feel natural to me. And that's something that I don't know if you can write tests for. Like you can write tests for this animation took longer than it should have, right? Because you just benchmark it and you say this benchmark's too high. But the flip side of it is, is that, um, you know, this didn't animate in a natural way. You kind of need human eyes on it for that. And so you, you, you're going to run into some of that stuff. But yeah, you can test for it. Um, the, the difference is, is, you know, how much time and effort are you saving a human being to have to go do that? And can your tests accurately represent what you're worried about? Yeah, that was a, a bit of feedback from our iOS team when I was asking them about this topic. Like, hey, like, what is your what are your thoughts on automated testing? Um, one of the things they said was, um, you know, on mobile and on iOS, like the, the, the visual performance, like the, the expectations are very high. And we try to create apps to a high level standard as well. And so like the animation needs to be smooth. The thing that is always said, and I kind of say as a joke now, is like that table view needs to scroll at 60 frames per second. Like it's all about the table view on iOS. And like mm-hmm. 59 frames per second is not okay because like, I can tell. Right. Um, and so it's like, if you're going to be manually testing that to see that anyways, like, like you'll see if the table view crashes. Like, so yeah. may, maybe they, there's not a lot of, cost savings or any cost savings in that case. Um, and even like if, if the goal is just, hey, well, I just need an end-to-end test just to make sure the app doesn't crash at all, if it actually successfully starts, it's like, well, if you're always going to be manually pulling it up to see it anyways, then maybe you've got that case covered. Um, so yeah, almost always, I feel like, I mean, being uh, in some sense, it's kind of a middle of the road person. I, I feel like yeah, the manual testing aspect, there'll always be a, li- is a little bit of it at least, at least you know, manually testing the functionality you're working on right now. I actually asked, uh, I think it was somebody over at Wix, um, the creators of Detox, because mm-hmm. I think I heard them talk about in various conference talks about like, uh, you know, just deployments with like no manual QA. Like we can deploy our stuff with total confidence or like high enough confidence to make it go live. And I was like, but how, but what about 60 frames per second? What about those table views, you know? And I think what they said is that they had interest in automating that as well. Um, 
in yeah. uh, finding ways maybe, uh, you know, there's visual diffing algorithms now to check yeah. if screens have not been changed. And so I think that they described like even thinking about uh, video testing, like, you know, recording the tool test tools will record the video of your test if you want. And so maybe some ways to automate that if they could see um, if the, uh, the, the frame rate was off. Even with that though, I don't know, like my view is like, okay, maybe you solve for that case, but it's like, you never know all the things that a human testing it is gonna find. And even the exploratory testing aspect of it, I, that's a term for, that encapsulates some of what you just said, where it's like, hey, like all the things I was looking for as I manually tested this were fine, but I noticed this one thing, like I noticed that yeah. this change we we asked for actually doesn't make sense anymore. And so like, I mean, unless you have crazy AI in the future, you're never gonna be able to automate that. So I definitely don't think that uh, manual testing ever fully goes away, at least to discover things like that. When I'm building a new product, G2i is the company that I call on to help me find a developer who can build the first version. G2i is a hiring platform run by engineers that matches you with React, React Native, GraphQL, and mobile engineers who you can trust. Whether you are a new company building your first product or an established company that wants additional engineering help, G2i has the talent you need to accomplish your goals. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about what G2i has to offer. In my experience, G2i has linked up with experienced developers that can fit my budget, and the G2i staff are friendly and easy to work with. They know how product development works and can help you find the perfect engineer for your stack. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about G2i. Yeah, I, I mean, there is some of that, but to be perfectly honest, I mean, if you've let's say that you've got these issues solved in version 1.12, right? And then you release version 1.13 and you want to put it out. I mean, maybe you just do it for the, the major and minor versions or something like that. Um, but, you know, if you're doing a bug fix, you don't need to do this on, on all of them, right? And so the, the, the issue then becomes, and I'll admit, you know, QA teams slow the process down for deployment, right? And so if you can bypass the QA team for you know minor really minor things then you can continue to move quickly and then if something does pop up then then you're in a position to just jump on it and handle it right and then you can hand it off to qa quickly before you push it out but you know to to the point you're making from wix they've got enough confidence that the changes that they're pushing out on a regular basis are not going to cause these kinds of issues and then if they do then you know, to a certain degree, I think it is okay to rely on your users to report these issues. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I, you know, 100% rely on them, but that's why you automate the, you know, the issues, right? So it's, okay, well, we ran into this bug, we fixed the bug, and here's a test that makes sure that we fix, you know, that it's not going to regress. And, you know, so that's, and you hear the term regression testing, that's essentially what it is, is you put a test in to make sure that, you know, that bug doesn't get reintroduced in some way. And so, yeah, the point about user I, I can testing, see their point of view there too. Right. You know, something that I've been learning and interacting with these QA folks is how common it is to have different groupings or tags within your QA automation test suite. Um, and uh, that was less common, at least for the size of applications that I was working on in Rails. Mm -hmm. It was generally like those acceptance tests that like we generally ran all of them. Maybe there was a few JavaScript enabled ones that we uh, tagged so that we could exclude them if we wanted to because they needed to use uh, the Selenium driver that was a bit more flaky and they were longer, but we did want to cover yeah. those cases. But the deal, to, to go off on a bit of a digression, the deal with um, Rails server rendered web apps using this Capybara tool was that you know the, the request response cycle of server rendered pages is very deterministic. And so uh, you know automating those, like you knew when the process was done because you received your response. Like there was right. no asynchrony going on there. Um, I think also the DOM, uh, It'll, I think it allows the UI to be scripted more reliably than native platforms because it's a it's a standard, like it's a published standard and everything yeah. there is a DOM element. Whereas like on the native platform, I've got different views, but maybe my uh, my navigation controller, like my, my iOS stack navigation, it works in just a different way. And so like, it's, it's kind of indirect. Like how do I refer to that element? How do I pull it up? It can just be trickier, certainly trickier to come and adding tests after the fact. Um, so yeah, I think those, the, the constraints on the web are, are just different. Um, and it, this relates to cost and benefit. So if, if it is in fact easier and more consistent and more reliable to create end-to-end -end tests on the web, then th there's you, you don't need as much benefit to make the cost worth it. And so you might reach them much more often. 
Whereas on mobile, like because of the possibility of flakiness, because of the effort of figuring out how to target things on the screen, maybe you're more likely to save it just for those absolutely critical paths on mobile. And that, that, that trade-off makes sense. Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind is that most of the engines that you're running things on on the web uh, tend to be the same engines, right? I mean, uh, Safari and Chrome and now Edge, because Edge is moving to Chromium, I'll use web, a WebKit, right? And so if you're going to run into a, a problem, you're most likely, you know, unless they've modified WebKit or doing something on top of it, it's probably going to be a problem with WebKit, right? To a certain degree. Right. I mean, there are UI things, there are plugin things, right? And so that complicates it. And boy, do the plugins complicate things on the web. But that said, I mean, in the mobile space, the other thing you run into is, is the same kind of issue, except it's, okay, well, here's the Android kernel, but what version of Android and what are the resources that it can run and all these things, you know? Uh, the iPhones seem to be a little bit more standardized or a lot more standardized, but you can still run into weird stuff, right? How old is the phone and what kind of memory does it have? And, uh, you know, how much space is on it and things like that. You know, most people update to the latest version, but are they on an old phone that won't update to that version? And so th there are still things there too. And it's, it's interesting to say, okay, you know, what do we support and what do we, what do we ignore? And so, yeah, there's that. The other thing is, is that your, uh, your, your iPhone apps or your uh, Android apps, your mobile apps are much more tied to the hardware than you run into in the web. Because if it'll run in the web browser, it'll run in the web browser, right? It may take it longer to load if you didn't build it right, but it'll still eventually get there, you know? And so that, you know, it, it the, the concerns are different, but in the same uh, vein, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of line them up. Some of them are, are, are pretty similar, but yeah, when you're running on the metal, like you are on a, on a mobile device, it just, it does, it changes the, the game a little bit because you're worried now about memory management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And your browser does all that for you on the web. It's so interesting the different perspective of someone like me as a web developer who has come into mobile application development versus a mobile application developer who's coming over onto the web or adding web to their skill set. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to the constraints of the web. It's like, oh, these are the yeah. kinds of things that I can build. This is how my brain even thinks about what an application is. Yeah. And cool, I can do that on mobile as well. And oh, look, I've got these bonus APIs. Like I can hook into this, I can hook into that. But yeah. it's like the kinds of things that I'm thinking of doing with a mobile application are very similar to what you can do on the web. Versus a mobile developer starting with, you know, the, the sky's the limit for the things that they could do. And for them looking at a web browser, it's like, okay, like that is a very small subset. And yeah. so like I, you know, as they think about like developing web applications or whether they would, or when they just think about like, hey, can I automate everything to do here? It's like, well, there's so many things in mobile development that like, how would you automate checking that the right sound is playing? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't think about that on the web, even though it yeah. is built into the web, because I just think about, you know, links to click and forms and is an image displayed on the screen. So I think just paradigms of the breadth of like what is an application uh, differs. And so of course, everything that we've discussed could be very different depending on if you're building a game on iOS yep. or a life critical pacemaker system or something like that. Is that the, the types of applications differ a lot. Yeah, I've been playing lately with the web audio APIs in Electron. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, they even think about those things differently, right? You know, so we're talking about like an actual device that it has to connect to this being a microphone or a camera, right? And on the phone, it's just built in because it's built into the phone. And here it's, okay, well, you've got to get permission, and, <laughs> you know, and then once you have permission, and they do that on the phone too, to some degree. But once, once you're there, then it's, you know, it's just not as straightforward because it's not a common use case there either. And so you're dealing with all these different things. Um, coming back around though, to talk a little bit more about QA versus development and, you know, where the testing boundaries are. To some degree, I think this is an organizational decision, right? Um, it's, you kind of have to define wh where, whose job ends and the other begins, right? And so for me, at least, the organization needs to sit down and say, okay, you know, the, the developer's job, for example, is to write working code. And so it, insofar as the UI automation falls under that, then they should be doing it, right? And, you know, you can, you can uh, fine tune those roles a bit, right? But to a certain degree, I mean, if the, the developers are not writing working code, then 
the, the QA's job gets a whole lot harder, right? And then on the other end, the QA's job is to make sure that the, the customer has a good experience, right? So again, to the degree that the QA team needs to do uh, UI automation or end-to-end -end testing, or whether or not they're just going to, you know, go through and tap or click or whatever on their end, you know, their job is to make sure that's happening. And as long as everybody's filling their roles, I don't see that one necessarily precludes the other from participating in one way or the other, right? It's, it's, Hey, look, you do your, your job and you do your job, figure out how you're going to do it. And yeah, I mean, if you're both doing UI automation, then sit down together and don't duplicate effort. But other than that, I, I don't see that uh, QA should be threatened by the idea of UI automation nor should the developers feel like they can't do UI automation because it's QA's job, right? Um, I definitely see this as in the wheelhouse of both, but an organization could define it completely differently and say, no, UI automation is clearly the realm of one or the other. And so it, it's interesting because it's like, look, we have this shared concern is, is where I see it. And, uh, you know, so should, should one or the other be doing it? Well, I think that in a lot of ways is an organizational decision. And I opt, at least for me and in my organizations, I opt for your job is to make these kinds of things happen. And then I let them figure it out, right? And so I, in this case, I would almost expect that QA and development would sit down together and say, we're gonna do some UI automation on some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, one of the things that I've been learning is just figuring out what it is that each of us is looking for and to what degree, you know, I was like, hey, I'm writing end-to-end -end tests. Oh, you're gonna write end-to-end -end tests? Cool, like we're doing the same thing. Let's help each other yeah. out. And I, in, in my head, it was all in the same category. And I, I had some understanding of like, hey, I certainly don't know QA's job. Like I certainly am not intending to dictate anything to y'all about what you need. Um, but it was, it did fall into the same category for me. Yeah. Um, whereas some of the things that I've been learning as we've been asking questions and discussing together is like what needs are at least somewhat different. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things I've learned is at least in our approach, you know, we will develop features over a sprint. Um, we'll do one or maybe several builds that are released to QA over the course of a two week sprint. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, when QA gets the build, that's when their testing can begin. Now, maybe, you know, on this project, we're just ramping up the QA automation. So right. maybe they will have written those automated tests in advance, or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll start when they get the build. But either way, the running of it won't happen until we produce the build and they have it. Yeah. So that's the point that that feedback comes in. So for the developers, what I'm looking for and coming out of my web circles, especially this feedback that I've gotten was to have some of these tests run on CI on each pull request. Mm -hmm. And so whether I'm doing test driven development, which I prefer, where I write the, the feature test for that right. feature that I'm building, or whether I write it afterwards or even just adjust existing end end tests that are there to make sure they keep passing, like I want the feedback at the same time that, we're, that the PR is running, that not only are my units of code working as expected, but those those user flows are working as well. Yeah. Um, so the timing of that feedback is a difference in what I'm kind of looking for. Um, I think also I, I mentioned like the stubbing out of the back end, where um, at, I'm kind of going with Cypress's advice, where it's like, hey, right now in this context, I'm not actually testing end to end. I want to look at our application, like this specific React Native application. Right. And to see if it's succeeding, like we'll we'll get the, the backend integration later, but let me stub it out here, and that increases the reliability. Like if our QA process lets us say, hey, here's our percentage of passing tests, and it's fine. Like we know we haven't fully gotten this one deterministic, or you know the backend was down at the day we ran this test, so like now we know, and here's the here's the report. Versus yep. if my CI will fail if the test doesn't pass, um, then that's a problem. And that's, you know, going back to what I was saying about those tests in uh, Capybara in the Rails world, because those were server rendered pages, they were very reliable and very deterministic. Yes. And so we ran almost all of them almost all the time and every CI run, they were fast as well. Mm -hmm. And so they failed to build. Um, so whether, maybe we wouldn't, um, you know, uh, have quite as many developer end-to-end -end tests for React Native, or maybe we'd have different groupings of them or something. Right. But whatever I do run on CI, I want it to be some kind of reasonable time frame. So at least yeah. by the time like the code review is done, that it'll be passed and ready to go. And I want to be able to say, hey, whatever those tests I'm running on CI, they all pass. Like we, we cannot merge until they're passing. So that's yeah. the kind of test that I want there. Yeah, and I think that's just another part of the same conversation, right? Is what role does each part of your process play, right? What yeah. part does CI play? What part does CD play, right? Continuous deployment. Um, 
and and I've seen mobile teams do continuous deployment, right? So it gets thrown onto a CI machine. It runs all the tests. It assumes everything's good. And then it deploys the app, right? It pushes it to the app stores. And, you know, a lot of times that works and it allows you to iterate quickly, you know? So just as quickly as you introduce a bug, you can introduce a fix. Um, so, yeah, I, I think really it, it does come down a lot to just what are you looking for from this, right? And so you're talking about CI in a very specific use case where it's like, look, you know, the CI's job is to tell me something's broken, right? Reliably tell me something's broken. So I don't want false positives. I don't want false negatives. And I don't want it to report on anything that doesn't speak to whether or not the app is working. And so if, <clears throat> if I put in an end-to-end -end or UI automation test that isn't specific to that output, then it's a waste, right? That may be something, it may fall under what QA's role is, right? And so QA may have their own system that they run it through. But, you know, for my uses, for the role that I'm, you know, putting CI in, that's the way that I'm looking at it. Yeah, you know, and another difference that comes to mind is, and I may have alluded to this earlier, you know, if the focus in developer test is, hey, like, did I, did I build out the right features? And it's like, okay, well, I'm running on React Native. Like React Native should run on iOS and Android. I, I would definitely want, mm -hmm. if I had a cross-platform app, I definitely want to run those uh, yes. UI automation tests on both. I would not want to assume that both of those work because there's so many platform differences. But like, if it should run on a bunch of different Android devices, it's like, well, you know, on my CI, like on my PRs, I probably don't feel the need to run on a bunch of different Android versions. Right. But maybe, you know, before the release, maybe when we create a build and send it over to QA, maybe they would run on a bunch of different yeah. versions or the most primary supported ones. And so there's a level of assumptions that we make on like, hey, like React Native should run on a bunch of different Android devices. I mean, same if you're building a native app, like, hey, right. like, this Android uh, UI library should run just fine on a bunch of different devices. That's good enough for CI to merge the feature down, but right. it's not good enough. Like we want to manually or automatically test yeah. on our suite of test devices to double check at that point, but it's not something that we want to slow down CI for. Mm -hmm. um, or even if, if there is, if, if using the tools, and this is something that QA said is like, hey, like, you know, for Appium for, um, for developer tests, like, you know, Appium is really great. Like, it may not have the reliability that you need for those CI, uh, for the PR right. approvals. And it's like, hey, that makes a lot of sense. They have experience with this. They know. Yeah. So it's like, hey, let's get that breadth of testing there that Appium can provide us in the suite that QA runs, but let's not introduce that to CI because that will, um, that non-determinism is going to undercut any of the benefits that we would have hoped to get from it running in that environment. Yep. Now, there, there's one other thing that I kind of want to talk about here because you're talking about using uh, QA's expertise to you know expand what you're doing and make sure that you're doing things in, in the proper way. And I, I really like that. Um, I've also been on teams where the developers hated QA because QA was always holding up the build, right? Um, when I worked in QA at Mosey, um, I got in and we held up the build. I'm not kidding you for two or three months. And this was after the acquisition. And so EMC was breathing down the neck of the COO or whatever he was at that point, general manager, um, to get a new version out. And we knew that there were a couple of critical bugs that hadn't been fixed. And the developers were working on them, right? We weren't, we weren't putting any pressure on them. But it turned into this situation where um, everybody was kind of frustrated with us, right? Because we kept uh, bringing up critical issues. The flip side is, is that I've also seen it where the development teams uh, turn QA into a dumping ground, where essentially they write the, the, uh, the feature, they add it into the app, and they kind of do a cursory run through and then they push it over. And then QA is constantly bringing it back to them with problems. And, you know, I've also seen it where, you know, uh, QA is a little bit aggressive about the way that they bring problems back. And so by coming to understand each other and what your roles are, and then having a clear, clearly defined process for a lot of this, right? So if QA finds a bug, then they, you know, do we classify it, you know, as critical or, you know, something we need to fix later or, you know, just kind of a nuisance that, you know, next time somebody's in that code, you know, go make it cleaner. Um, you know, if, if we can classify the bugs and then we have a process for each one, this, is, this one's a critical bug, it's a security bug, we can't release with it in there, blah, 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 versus, um, you know, some of the other situations where, um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, we're okay 
pushing it live because the bug was already in there and people have already been dealing with it, right? And we'll fix it in the next release. But, you know, th that keeps a lot of the animosity between the two groups from forming and allows instead better communication. So then the communication can be, hey, look, um, the process is getting in the way on this particular issue, so we're going to update the process. Or, hey, you know, this, this doesn't fall squarely into our role in the company or yours, so let's expand the definition of one of our roles to take it on. Or, hey, you know, you, you, you push this feature in, but it doesn't even work on anything, right? And so how do, we, how do we update the process so that we're getting working code? Or you know, just things like that. And so if you can communicate about that and you can communicate a little bit dispassionately about some of these issues, then you can get a long way toward making it work. And then you can make both the development team and the QA team an asset in making sure that your code's reliable. That's really encouraging to hear because I think uh, the, the positive, the collaborative, collaborative aspect is just what we're experiencing right now on my client. Yeah. And so that's really great. Um, and like the QA engineers are on our team. You know, they sit with us, they work with us. Yeah. It's not this big separation. I, I just have such a, so many positive experiences working on small teams where you know people and you talk and you decide together. Yeah. And it's not a sense. I mean, it's just, I, I have totally been there. So I totally understand the temptation, but thinking at it from the outside, the idea of, you know, QA is holding up the bill because they identified this defect. It's like, the idea of blaming QA is baffling to me because it's like, the defects, like that behavior is there, or like in the yeah. code. And so it's like, like you are, it's the definition of shooting the messenger. Um, but I think in large organizations, there can be organizational things that happen and incentives and communication paths that make those kind of misunderstandings inevitable. And I, I don't know how to solve it for large organizations, but I, I love small teams and I love working closely and communicating in just the way you said, and just the getting to know one another so that you, um, know the standpoint that it comes from and that you know that you really are working together as a team like hey we all want to get this release done and we all know the constraints we're operating under and like what's the best we can do for right now and how can we improve yeah. things in the future yep and just by keeping the communication lines open i mean even in larger uh, organizations what the problem really breaks down to is communication mm -hmm. and so you know even if you have to circumvent the sort of and I know I'm telling people to break the rules, but if, <laughs> if you have to circumvent the normal means of communication to get the things done and to make things work, sometimes you just do. And if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. But the thing is, is at the end of the day, you're getting the job done, you're doing it right. And you're avoiding a whole lot of frustration with, with the people or the process or anything else. And so, yeah, just make sure that you keep those lines of communication open and you know, do the best you can to understand the people on the other side of it, because ultimately you're all working for the same goal. And if you can make that collaboration as seamless as possible and understand where everybody's at, that, that just goes a long, long, long way. Yeah. Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood and I just launched my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there. The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. As we move forward towards kind of wrapping up the episode, I just want to give major props to Wix for developing Detox. Same for the Cypress team for their startup creating this tool. Um, Cypress in particular hits upon just the transformational nature that can happen when you have new tooling that's different, that solves problems in a different way. And I think that's true to a large degree. Like once the cost goes down, the number of times you can reach for the benefits of these tools goes way up. And like whatever organizational communication things need to happen, the better the tools we have, the better off we are. And I think these, these two tools in particular do an amazing job and allowing us to create more reliable software. And that means we yep. can deploy it more frequently. And it's not just about, oh, cool, you got an update sooner. It means we can get a security fix in really quick before people's data is compromised. And it means we can, as a startup or as a large company, we can do an experiment, put it out there, find out what's working, what's not working, and change it. And so there's, I mean, there's just real organ, you know, paradigm shifting changes to the ways we can build software. And um, again, I, I gave a meetup talk one time about uh, the, the kind of life of worry that I had before I had automated testing and before I had agile development. And I just, I would never want to go back there. And I, it's why I'm so passionate about teaching about testing is because I want people to benefit from these as much as they can. And like, Hey, like if you're on a platform different from me, if you're doing really in-depth mobile development and there's constraints that I don't know about, like 
more power to you. Like, good luck. Like, let me know if I can help you brainstorm. Um, if you have different organizational constraints and needs, like, hey, work within those and figure out what's yep. the best for your team. But like when Detox and, and Cypress create these new tools, it, it's, it's just pure removal of cost. It just gives us more options to design these solutions together and just make better software and make people's lives better. So thanks yep. to all those folks for, for doing the hard and low level work of building these tools and coming up with creative solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the tools do make a difference. And, you know, in some ways, like you said, you know, some of these tools are going to be new, right? They're, they're going to they're gonna be coming out and, you know, uh, detox. And then somebody's going to look at detox and they're going to be like, oh, well, you know, I wish it did this better. And then realize that there are constraints within detox that make it harder for it to do it better. And so they go make their own tool. And that now we have two great tools, right? So, um, I mean, that that's the other thing is, you know, don't, don't be afraid to look at the system and find a better way to do things. Definitely. Do you have anything else about this you want to discuss? I think that covers my kind of questions and things I'm exploring right now. No, not particularly. I mean, uh, you know, the, the only other thing that I've, I've seen with some of this is that, um, so when I was working QA, we had half the team in Utah or two of us in Utah and there were like four or five other people in India that we were working with, you know, cause we got acquired by EMC corporation. And so they, you know, they handed a lot of the QA work off to these other folks. I mean, they didn't decrease our headcount at all to do it. They just added resources. Right. And you know, they were terrific people on, you know, basically on the other side of the ocean. Um, they were 12 and a half hours or 11 and a half hours, depending on how you look at it removed from us. And so we'd either show up at six in the morning or we'd stay until six or six 30 in the evening to talk to them. And again, you know, that communication became really, really important. Uh, the, the nice thing about it though, was that we could go home and we could come back and get a report on what tests they had run while we were asleep. And, you know, same thing for us. Right. So then they'd come back around and we could give them feedback and, and, you know, get feedback from the developers and the other people on the development team. And so uh, I, I guess my point is twofold. One is, is that you may be dealing with people that are not even in the same building in the same state or in the same country as you um, or in the same time zone as you. And there are ways to make that work. Right. So um, don't get disheartened by that. And the other thing is, is that honestly, that communication is so crucial, you know, especially in those situations. So if you are looking at a, a situation, you know, where we didn't describe every aspect of what you're looking at, just sit down, sit down with the people involved and just say, look, you know, how do we make sure that we are doing the best job we can so that we understand where the other's coming from? We know what's going on. There aren't any surprises because usually that's where people get hung up is, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. And it really kind of, you know, it, it's painful to deal with in some way. And so, yeah, if you can get to that place where you're actually communicating about it and, you know, hey, here's, here's the Slack channel or whatever that we're going to communicate in, or here's the, the, this, that, or the other, right? Here, here are the terms under which you should call me in the middle of the night um, if that's necessary, right? Because, I mean, they're 12 hours off. So middle of the afternoon, they need an answer. It's 2 a.m. here. Well, maybe they actually do need to call me. So, you know, just make sure that you, you, you're thinking through it. And then the other thing that I would put out there is with all of these processes, especially across multiple teams or multiple roles, is don't be afraid to examine the process and make it better. You know, Josh mentioned uh, agile development and those ideas apply here. They apply more here because if, if everybody's working generally on the same thing in the same role, it's really easy to talk about it with the other people because everybody has the same concerns. And if you're in different roles, then you need to be working in a place where you're communicating more and you're making the process work for you more. And everybody's plugged in in a little bit different spot on the process. And so if the process isn't working, then give yourselves permission to talk about it and change it. Yeah, I think that's the idea of a retrospective when it really works yeah. well. And projects I've had where retrospective is really motivating is we say, hey, here's what's going well, here's what's not going well this past sprint or whatever. Um, yep. And then it's like, in, in, in places where it's motivating to do a retro is things where it's like people decide as a team, like, cool, okay, here's what we're going to do differently this next sprint. Yep. In other teams and in organizations where through no fault of anybody on the team necessarily, it's like, oh, well, this is really painful. 
well, we can't really change it because we don't have access, administrator access, yeah. or this is the thing, or leadership requires this to be reported or things like that. And so that's actually not a problem with the retro now that I think about it. It's yeah. a problem with the fact that like you're in a, just an organization where for one reason or another, change is harder. Like it's just harder to bring about changes. And so it's not that the retrospective is unmotivating. It's that mm -hmm. it's surfacing the fact that your team's under constraints that it seems like you can't really do yeah. much about. Um, but yeah, so I would encourage folks to do a retrospective and try to make a change. And uh, even if it's pushing back, like, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're tempted to just suffer under oh, this is the way it is. Like this is the inter-team communication process or the software deployment process or whatever, even though it's painful. But like, you know, raise the question and push back and explain, as you were saying, like the, the reasons why explaining like this is the benefit that the whole team is going to get and the end customer is going to get if we can put this or that in place. And mm -hmm. that will lead to motivating retrospectives, I think. Yeah. And I've been in organizations, too, where we essentially had to work around those constraints. Like we, we went outside the approved uh, system that the organization had given us to make it work. And, you know, that that's hard, too, because then you don't have any support. And sometimes there's some risk involved. If they find out that we're doing this, it's not going to go well. But, you know, I've been in organizations where that's what it took. And so, you know, I, again, I'm not, I'm not necessarily encouraging people to what skirt what their boss would want or something or put their job at risk. But just keep in mind that some organizations aren't going to bend. And if they're not going to bend, your options are find another way or leave. And so, you know, but for the most part, organizations are made of people. And, you know, I found that for the most part, if you can make the case, a lot of times you can get the change you need. So, yeah. All right. Well, should we do some picks? Let's do it. All can right. Go first? Yeah. Why don't you go first? Cool. Um, my picks uh, this time. Uh, the first one, interestingly, is it's parallel to testing, but it's a different topic. And it's the topic of code review. Um, so I say that's another practice that just from since starting at Big Nerd Ranch that I've been doing. I mean, it's for some folks, even like code school graduates, it's like, what do you mean you never did code review before? But we just literally like you built your code and you checked it in and then I built my separate code in another part of the app and we just hoped that it worked. And this was back in the days of no automated tests, by the way. So you can imagine how well that went. Um, but I say to folks, as much as I'm obsessed with automated testing, um, I would be willing to do without it on a certain project with the right platform, the right constraints. But I don't think I could do without code review um, anymore. It's just the benefits that I've seen from having somebody else, and specifically I have in mind here a pull requests, you know, work on you know, a single feature, kind of atomic use, unit of user-facing work, push it up in a pull request, describe it. Somebody else on the team looks at it, or if you're a one-person team, like somebody else from another team in your organization looks at it, gives feedback, um, you make enhancements, um, and uh, just the learning that comes from that, the catching of bugs you wouldn't otherwise catch the opportunity to clarify the code. And just, I mean, the really tangible thing that it comes down to is, you know, you're going to be on vacation someday and somebody else on your team, well, let's flip it around. Somebody else on your team is going to be on vacation someday. You're going to get the bug in the code that they wrote and you want to have seen it before. Or if you haven't seen it, you want somebody else to a third party who have seen it to have encouraged them to name things clearly uh, and to get things consistent with the, the way it behaves is the way that it looks like it behaves so that the code is more maintainable. And so I... The, the the benefits that I've seen from code review are just, uh, I can't estimate how big they are. Um, now, I know some folks have worked in places where it's a really discouraging experience and you just get like really, you know, criticized and demeaned in code reviews. And that's terrible. Um, I, I hope I never work in a place like that, or I hope that I do so I can push back to make it better. So code review, if you've been turned off in that way, doesn't have to be like that. Um, it can be a place where you encourage one another to say, hey, this is a really cool solution. I haven't seen this language feature before, or I wouldn't have thought about handling this case. Good job. Or asking clarifying questions like, why did you do this this way? Oh, cool. Now I understand. Thank you. So it doesn't just need to be changes that you're requesting. So I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe we can have a whole discussion someday about code review. Oh, um, heck yeah. Yeah. Oh, heck so. Yeah. I advocate code review. I think it's really great. Um, the other thing uh, that's maybe controversial is Slack. Um, a lot of hate on Slack. A lot of people don't like it. Uh, some people in, who are influential that I respect their views in many ways are down on it. Um, and I respect their views on it, but I, I find it to be very positive. Um, so I, you know, we are uh, about half of our company right now is local to Atlanta, but half of us are remote. I am far enough from the office that I'm effectively remote. And so, um, so we are to sort of a, a remote first company in that sense. All of our meetings have a video. Um, everybody always signs onto the video when they join a meeting. And unless you know for sure that everybody's going to be local there. 
helps us work with clients that aren't uh, in Atlanta. Maybe they're somewhere else. And so we work that way. Um, and so we end up going with um, asynchronous processes. So everything is tracked in the story tracker. All code review does happen in pull requests. We try to you know, use channels at, uh, on, on Slack so for conversations to happen so that others can see them later. And it's like, oh, cool, now I've learned that. Oh, I can chime in with some perspective that the two of you didn't have. And so I think that's really beneficial. Um, so we find a lot of productivity from it. I know the folks that tend to have really bad experiences with Slack and other chat tools like that is, it's another inbox I have to read. This stuff happening all the time. I'm expected to be logged in. I'm expected to be reading. And I just get harangued from all these different uh, places, just people requesting all these different things. So one of, you know, some of it is situational. Like I know as a consultancy where we have a lot of small teams working on client projects, we often don't have a lot of demands for one another. Like our, our client project is where we're committed to be. And then in our kind of other channels, like our kind of web development wide channel or React Native wide channel is totally optional. You just chime in if and when you want. You can put the word out there and say, hey, I'm running into this. Has anybody seen this? Um, and there's no expectation that people respond. Um, so I certainly don't say that everybody should be using Slack or needs to be. And I don't have a solution for all the, the negative experiences that some folks have. But it can be done well in the right organization. And uh, we've really enjoyed it and benefited from a ton. I, I mean, as a remote developer, I can't, I would just feel so disconnected from my teams if I didn't have this way to chat with folks um, throughout the day and, you know, chat in channels about sharing pictures of our kids or dogs or talking about scary movies around Halloween time. Um, so my personal experience with Slack is really positive. I'm sure most of our listeners have probably heard about it, uh, but I just wanted to share that it's been a good thing for us. Nice. And those are my picks. Yeah. Uh, we use Discord on my team. So, but yeah, a lot of the same things that you're saying, you know, apply there. Um, so for the shows this year, or I've, or yeah, this year leading into Christmas, and I know that some of the episodes are probably going to come out after Christmas, but for the shows this year, I've been picking Christmas movies and specifically I'm picking Christmas movies that are a little on the older side. So, um, there are just a lot of great classic movies that are awesome that I'm going to pick. And so, um, I'm going to throw those out there and then I'm going to throw out a pick to the to the book. So if you're, you know, on the job hunt or you want to just have that flexibility, you know, cause it, it talks you out about how to get in the door, but those things essentially, a lot of them apply to just being in a good position to know somebody to just, you know, go pull the trigger and uh, you know, and get a job on a moment's notice, you know, if you get laid off or, you know, something goes down at work. Um, so yeah, anyway, the, the first pick that I have, um, and I'm curious, so listeners, you can answer, uh, Josh, if you know, you know the answer to this, of course, you're looking at the chat, so you probably know the answer to this, it's in there, is uh, I, I wonder if people know what movie the song White Christmas first appeared in. I think I would have known the answer if you hadn't posted it, because we, have, my wife and I have seen both of those movies, Right. Um, but I'll, I'll stall for just a second while people are thinking, and you can pause the podcast if you want to go to rack your brain. Yeah. So my first pick, I guess I'll pick the other movie. The other movie is actually called White Christmas. And it has uh, Bean Crosby and Danny Kaye in it. And it is hilarious. It is such a fun movie. Um, absolutely love that movie. It's one of the go-tos every year that I just really, really enjoy watching. Um, and it's, you know, it was made in the 1950s. And it's awesome. But the, the song White Christmas actually first appears in Holiday Inn, which also features Bean Crosby. And it is, it's an awesome movie. I, I really, really love both movies. And uh, so if you're looking for kind of a different um, movie than what you're, what you're used to, you know, because a lot of the Christmas movies are kind of the, you know, Santa and his elves and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Holiday Inn has Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire in it. And uh, yeah, so definitely go check it out. Holiday Inn was made in 1942. So it's, it's actually, you know, 10 years older than uh, 12 years older than uh, white Christmas, but um, yeah, holiday Inn is them coming back from the war. If I remember right. And uh, you know, they, they go through a whole bunch of stuff. It's honestly, it's, it's one of my favorites. And then, yeah, the other one is um, like I said, white Christmas and it's, it's a different pace and they, you know, it's much more Christmas focused holiday Inn is it definitely has a lot of Christmas in it. And so I think of it as a Christmas movie, but it, it covers a lot of other stuff too. So 
anyway, definitely go check those out. Um, Bing Crosby is one of those classic people. Just go watch a movie he's in. Terrific singer, terrific performer. Watching Fred Astaire dance is just fun. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick those. And then, yeah, I, I put a link in the show notes as well to the book. Um, you can go get it on Amazon. When this goes live, it'll be up. By then, I should also have the have it available for you to order a print book if you want one. And you can also go get the audio book. I should have the audio book done by then as well. So um, yeah, those are my picks. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we have anything else, Josh. No, I think we're good. I, I advocate for those movies as well. I saw Holiday and Just Once, I think. But and I think it was good. But White Christmas is in our year, yearly rotation, so it's uh, it is quite yep. hilarious. So it's a big, it's a lot of fun. Yep. Yeah, I have a couple more that I'm definitely going to be picking over the next couple of weeks, and then I'll probably lay off after Thanksgiving because we're on like a a one to two week on some of the shows release cycle, and so then I'd be picking Christmas movies into New Year. <laughs> yeah, there's only a small subset of folks that will watch Christmas movies in January, but they're there. <laughs> yeah, and and yeah, if you get these in January, put them on your list and watch them next year, or just go watch them. I mean, heck, they're great movies. So yeah. All right, folks. Well, we'll have another show for you next week, and in the meantime, max out. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. 